What a fucking boring twist to your movie. What? Oh my god. It's, is that actually the ending? Yes. No, the ending is that the woman is the descendant of Jesus. Yeah, but also, yeah, there's also things that got on, like Catholicism. It's weird. Like Catholicism is the real yeah. Judaism? Yeah, that that like that was what he was hinting at. But ugh, what a boring movie. I never read the book, but I don't really care to. Well, Max, you know another movie that you never read the book to? But I do care to eventually. The Island of Lost Souls. On the Spectator Film Podcast? Yes. Welcome. Welcome, I'm Max. And I'm Austin. And today we're talking about The Island of Lost Souls. Indeed. Uh, Based on the book The Island of Dr. Moreau. By by H.G. Wells, Wells, of course, yes. yes. Also famous for War of the Worlds, amongst other many, many publications. None Um, of which I can think of. Yeah, exactly. Now that you've mentioned it. (laughs) The Invisible Man, I think he wrote that as well. Sure. Uh, And uh, Things to Come, obviously. Yeah. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Can't wait for the next one. Island of Lost Souls 2. Lost her souls. Um, Yeah, this was Austin's pick, but this was kind of an easy sell to me. Um, Well, you had seen this before. Yeah, Yeah. I I was just going to get in. I... When I was going through my phase of watching all of the old Universal horror movies with Dracula and the Wolfman and Creature from the Black Lagoon and all that areas, I also watched this. This does technically does not fall in with the Universal things. It wasn't made by them at the time, although... They, they own the rights to it now. Yes. Um, but it had Bela Lugosi in it. It was around the same kind of time period. It dealt with creepy monster things, so I thought this was this would be a good thing to fall in. I remember, like thinking this movie like wasn't really a horror movie when I saw it like just because it didn't it didn't feel like Dracula didn't feel like Frankenstein it didn't feel like any of that and I think that's because it's more just like supposed to like one if it's a product of its time where like we're desensitized to a lot of horrible horrible shit happening in the world today and I know vivisection, as you said, was like a hot topic at the time in the 30s. Well, also, hold on one second. What genre would you have put it in? I put it in as like a thriller type thing, like a sci-fi thriller when I first saw it. Or adventure. Yeah, and I don't necessarily disagree with that. Although revisiting it, I definitely kind of classify it as horror as well. Because genre is not exclusive and it's assigned arbitrarily. So Right. Much like definitions of humanity in this movie. This also... um, you brought this up in our pre-screening yesterday, but it does bear similarities to King Kong a bit, something that we'll dive more into. Yeah, that's what I was going to say in response to that genre question. Um, I do like this better than the original King Kong, I would say. I think Mm -hmm. it deals with some of the same themes much more sophisticatedly and has a lot of actors that I enjoy in this movie, so... Yeah. I I mean, yeah, I don't think King Kong like has a performance quite like the Charles Lawton performance. Yeah, well, Although you could argue, argue the King Kong performance itself yeah. is, is interesting in a spectacle. It's just in terms of human actors. It's, but yeah, there's nothing that really measures but up to it. But if you want a monster performance in this, Bela Lugosi as the law sayer does a great job. Excuse in me, it. sayer of the law? Okay, I'm How dare sorry. you fuck that up? I'm very sorry. H.G. Wells is going to break out of his <laughs> grave and then strangle you. What, he's dead? I thought you said he had books coming. <laughs> You lied to me. No, no, he would not mind if you fucked up that name because he apparently hated this movie. Um, yeah, this was uh, this was my pick, and uh, I really don't know why I picked this. I think it was just like I was looking at my shelf of movies and I'm like, oh god, it's Island of Lost Souls. Why, oh god, do you not enjoy this movie? Or no, I just I, that's my response to everything. Uh-oh. Now I'm just like living in a perpetual world of trauma. Where I don't know how to respond to anything. Oh, God, it's rings. <laughs> well, that one, it was truly justified. Yeah. Um, but, yes, yeah, so I decided to just pick this movie, and I felt like it would be a fun choice. And uh, I hadn't watched it since a few years ago for my horror project. Um, I think the first time I watched this was maybe five or six years ago. Uh, it was one of the first Criterion Collection movies that I ever owned. Um, so it was fun watching it then and revisiting it for this week. Um, definitely I can agree with you when you talk about how this movie is similar to stuff like King Kong, uh, and how it 
also introduces themes of colonialism and race and stuff like that. Although, again, this movie is a little bit more sophisticated in the way it deals with that stuff. And I think despite that sophistication, it doesn't ultimately escape a like white colonizing mindset. But I think it it is interesting. It remains interesting. And um, it does definitely try to explore those things. And we're going to talk about that in the commentary. But I think that sort of stuff is why it has a type of longevity that I feel like, you know, I feel like the first King Kong adaptation is a good entertaining movie, but it's like a little bit bare yeah. at certain points for me compared to this, where, you know, this, this movie has some really interesting production value and stuff like that, but it doesn't use it as a crutch the same way I feel like the original King Kong Speaking does. of the original King Kong, yeah. I'm just, just out of the blue. I'm curious. How do you feel about the remake of King Kong, the Peter Jackson 2005, 2004, whenever it was? Um, well, I remember at the time I watched it kind of enjoying it when I was like, what, nine or whatever when I saw it. Yeah. Um, I just haven't seen it in a long time. And you know what? I appreciate in adventure movies where they spend a decent amount of time building up to the adventure. But also, the movie is, what, three hours? Yeah. And you spend an hour getting to the island? That seems kind of excessive. <laughs> I, if I have a couple of days to kill, I'll probably rewatch it. Yeah. But. I mean, much like Peter Jackson, a lot of his stuff that he's done later in his career, I have the impression of the like 2005 King Kong that it is very much like sound filmmaking, except for the fact that he feels the need to turn everything up to 11. And that just makes it boring where it's like, it's the King Kong, it's the T-Rex fight, right? Yeah. He doesn't just fight one T-Rex. He's got to fight three at the same time. While juggling, while juggling uh, <laughs> Naomi Watts, and also they're going to fall off a cliff and get caught in vines. You know what I mean? And the fight is going to go on for 30 minutes. Yeah, I do remember, though, like the him breaking the T-Rex's mouth open was like one of the most like memorable movie moments of that summer. Or whenever. It Although, came honestly, I didn't like that because I was always obsessed with dinosaurs as a kid. Yeah. Yeah, fun fact about to everybody, uh, I was certain I was going to be a paleontologist when I was little. I was convinced. <laughs> Same, actually. Yeah, I went on a vac... I basically, like, annoyed my parents into scheduling a vacation when I was, like, four to go to Chicago Field Museum to see, at the time, what was the most complete T-Rex skeleton in the world. I was dead set on this. And when King Kong murdered those Tyrannosaurs, I'm like, I love this giant gorilla. But we also have small gorillas. <laughs> and we don't have any small, like, T-Rexes anywhere else. So if I had to choose who would win, I'd say maybe, like, let the T-Rex win because they don't <laughs> live anywhere else, you know? But I bring up uh, <laughs> King Kong. I, just, I also wanted to be a paleontologist, but then I realized I hated being in the sun. So that's... And you hated it. Scraping around in the dirt for no money. Yeah. <laughs> but I brought that up because this movie not got not just one, but two remakes. And I've heard one is, eh, and well, one is different adaptations. Bad. Yeah. Yeah. It's been the Island of Dr. Moreau, the original book, um, yes. which I also have not read, <clears throat> has been adapted several times, including this one. This is without a doubt the best adaptation. But you have the 1970s one with Burt Lancaster, and then you have the clusterfuck 90s one with Marlon Brando. Yes. Which is mostly only interesting if you want to watch something that's absurdly stupid, but also has insane Marlon Brando. He's insane in that movie. Well, yeah, he's like, what, over 300 pounds at the time? I think he was over 400 pounds um, and didn't want to move and... He refused to he, learn. His, yeah, refused to learn his lines. Right. He, he literally had an earpiece so the director could read him his lines. And just his outfit is a, absurd. He's like <laughs> got to stay out of the sun or whatever. So he's got like goggles and like a. It's a, it's crazy. It's nuts. 
So if you're interested in that sort of thing, you can watch that one. There's but this also is definitely do- the best. There's version. also a documentary talking about how just fucking terrible the entire production of the movie well, was. Well, yeah, that was one of those like lost movie documentaries that became super popular after yeah. Jodorowsky's Dune about Richard Stanley, who also is just a nut. Yeah. That guy's like fucking crazy. Um, but he was originally supposed to direct it, then the studio said, fuck off. Um, but yes, this movie is without a doubt the best adaptation of it. Yeah. So Also, nobody got divorced while playing the lead actor of this movie. Sorry, well, hmm. while researching... Do we the, know that for sure? No, I, I'm sure somebody will prove me wrong on that, but I was just doing some research, and during the 90s one, Bruce Willis which was originally set to be the lead and then dropped out because he was getting divorced from, I think, Demi Moore at the time. And then Val Kilmer took over to play for him, and then he was super angry and irritable on set because he was served divorce papers while he was in the filming of that movie. Well, Max, I'm tempted to jump into the commentary track right now, but then again, I might get served divorce papers right before we do so. That's only if you consider yourself the lead of this podcast, Dust. <laughs> <laughs> All right, are you ready to begin? Yeah, let's go. All right. Okay. While we're on the Criterion logo, the Spectator Film Podcast, mainly me, would like to issue a partial apology, but also a call out to Criterion. Because if you remember in the past, I have continuously said... You're guilty, Max. That hashtag Criterion hates the hearing impaired. Which I stand by. Because (laughs) (laughs) we discovered that while at least some of the Criterion Collection discs do have subtitles they do not have them as a function on the menu or anywhere on the disc you You, have to you do have to press the button on the remote you have to find a subtitles button on your remote which not every blu-ray player has and as i pointed out i watch blu-rays on my ps4 so if i'm deaf and only have that then i can't enjoy any of their movies so fuck you still criterion why would you do that why would you go through the trouble of programming subtitles and not having them be an option? Well, that's going to be real awkward when you apply for a job there later this year. Well, maybe with my sharp ideas of how to improve their discs, I'll get higher. <laughs> Put it in the menu, you son of a bitch. And expand their market to yes. other people. So, so that is Max's sincere apology. Yeah. Um, but at any rate, we are noticing a fun fact here. This was totally un- unintentional. But this is the second week in a row we are doing a movie that was photographed by Carl Struess. Yes. Uh, he, uh, if you're not aware, he photographed uh, Sunrise, Song of Two Humans, some of the greatest camera work of the silent era. And uh, while this camera work in this movie is not quite on the same level, I, I still think it is definitely something that seems like it was shot by a very capable um, craftsman. And it makes sense that would be the same person. That's a beautiful opening shot, by the way. It is. There's no way to fake that fog. I just had a very big fog machine. <laughs> but yes, so uh, we have our opening here. And um, right away, I think the King Kong comparisons are apt because you have the seafaring voyage. Although, like we've said, this one is maybe a little bit more sophisticated in the way it approaches that stuff. Um, and I think it has to do with the way that it confronts and sometimes doesn't confront its audience and sort of portraying the idea of these sailors as blue-collar workers who are now going to be implicated in this whole scheme of vivisection and eugenics. Because that's what this movie is really about. And that's a big change from the book, is the idea that, um, you know, the book, I think, is literally just vivisection, is where, I, I, again, neither of us have read it, but I get the impression from the book that it's just Dr. Moreau is sewing body parts together, Frankenstein style, but he's not, like, evolving them. Yeah. I think, like, because if I remember correctly, the 90s one is, like, him splicing human DNA into animals. Right. So I think it's, like, whatever hot science thing is topical at the time is what they go Well, essentially, that's... The thing is, though, him splicing human DNA... Is still eugenics. Yeah. That's like the thing. All three adaptations of this into a film, they've all been eugenics and not vivisection, which I think is more interesting because, like, like what is vivisection socially? You know, like yeah. 
eugenics offers you a an opportunity to talk a lot more about different social ideas, um, mostly because eugenics is much more closely tied to this idea of what is our definition of human, right? And how how what happens when somebody has the ability to determine what the definition of human is and then how people who don't fit that definition should be treated. Yeah. But we're introduced to protagonist man. Yes. Whose name I can never remember. I think his name is Parker. Yeah. But his name is protagonist. It's fine. Yeah. Protagonist man. He's a very bland character, but fun fact about this character that will also connect to our previous movie sunrise is that he is, uh, well, I forget this actor's name, but he was the lead in the 1927 movie Wings, which also won Best Picture in 1927, alongside Sunrise. Ah. Yeah, so weird coincidences here. Well, it was like the two different awards at the time. It was like, yeah. It was like, I forget what it was. Like, it's a sen- essentially a semantic difference. They yeah. both won Best Picture. However, they kind of in- the, the Academy kind of invented an award, um, specifically for Sunrise, just because they liked it so much, where it was like special artistic movie or whatever, whatever it was. Yeah. But they essentially split the award, which, as far as I know, is the only time that's happened. Well, that was because that was before uh, Best Picture, just in general, existed. From what I discovered with my research, um, they both had they sort of split it into two different categories. Yeah. But they're both the Best Picture winner for 1927, which was also the first year. Of the Academy Awards. Yeah, although I think they went back and said that the one that wasn't Sunrise technically holds the thing for Best Picture or whatever. I don't know, but who cares? It really isn't worth worth yeah. focusing on. Albert Block. Dun, dun, dun. Edward Parker. <laughs> Frank Johnson. <laughs> and just so you know, it was Edward Parker. So, Max, now that we've talked about the idea of eugenics... And that this is an adaptation about eugenics. What does that get us? That gets us to how this movie is essentially very much about colonialism, which is something that I think, you know, there's subtext to every movie. But I feel like compared to other horror movies of the time, this one, I I mean, I'm trying to think of another one that really tackles that subject from like this two or three year period. I guess White Zombie with Bela Lugosi is also kind of about colonialism. In a sort of explicit sense. Yeah, thing. sorry. When you say White Zombie, I just think of the Rob Zombie band. Sure. I'm flashbacks. sure they took their band name from that movie. They did. Yeah. Rob Zombie makes horror movie songs. That's basically all he does. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's some sort of uh, letterbox list of all the movies he's like, <laughs> he's sampled in his in his music. But, uh, but that movie also is like, again, it's more of like, I think that movie takes place in Haiti. So it's like that Haitian mm-hmm. idea of zombie, right? Um, but it's a very colonial movie. You have Bella Lugosi, who's kind of like a slave driver, you know. He he has these people, these quote unquote zombies who work his like mill and plantation or whatever. Um, and that's sort of what that movie is exploring. But that's really the only other one. And I think this movie is smarter than that one. So this is really, I think, the most intelligent examination of it. I do want to talk about, just because um, you're bringing that up, how we have all the white European men, mainly, and the women, wear bright, bright white suits. Right. And I know that's also for filming, because if you're doing black and white, you want white so you can... Yeah, black and white, because colors aren't going to show, and gray just sort of looks muddled. But also, it gives them sort of a glow around them in the lighting and tries to portray them like... Holier than thou, and even Doctor Moreau, who's a horrific person, he's still dressed in all white like that. And it's interesting coding. Then we have the blue collar worker who's wearing dull, dirty clothing because he's a yeah step below them on the rung. Yeah, I mean, there's a number of different ways that this movie organizes things visually into a hierarchy, yeah. which has to do with this eugenics idea, right? When you have Doctor Moreau, who's able to compose the image of what is human, then you have a descending order of like steps, right? And that also is true in the quote unquote natives, right? Some have different roles than others, and it depends on how close they are to the whiteness that Dr. Moreau has used as the basis of his definition of humanity. Um, in fact, we're going to see somebody who is closer 
soon. The very first quote unquote native that we see, which by the way, I think I'm just going to describe the like downcast animal victims as natives. Yeah. But every time I say that, remember people, huge quotes around the words native. Um, it's just the most convenient term, I think. And for uh, the purposes of just shortening and the purposes of talking about this movie as a metaphor for colonialism. Right. Yes. And also the idea that, you know, when, when the characters re- like refer to them as natives, there's a very important subtext in this movie about how that idea of the native is something that is projected onto people by white colonial people. And also how that the definition of what a native is, is artificial is something that this movie also examines. But yes, this character Maling, right? He is quote unquote more successful than a number of other natives, which is why he's the one who serves food, right? He's the one who's the butler. Yes. He's the loyal dog though. (laughs) Yeah. It's a good, good punch right there. That's a good action scene. Boop, boop. I wish we had more action scenes like that. I wish that was how they killed Thanos. <laughs> Thanos just punches quickly with the infinity gauntlet. And, <laughs> and just misses. And yeah. then it's all over. Punches him in the face. That'd be great. I might actually care about the Marvel. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to say here, this is a movie that we're discussing in terms of being about colonialism and specifically addressing the like dehumanizing and horrifying effects of colonialism. However, I think already so far we've seen two things that this movie does to distance a critique from its audience and make its audience feel more comfortable. Okay. First thing it does is it gives us this bland milk toast protagonist character. But what it does is it makes him shipwrecked. They pick yes. him up while he's drifting at sea. So is he is in no way implicated in participating in this transaction of delivering these animals to Dr. Moreau, right? And we know that that is, that is a shady transaction because right here in this scene where they're delivering the animals to Moreau's little boat, we're going to see a sailor say, like, you know, nobody really knows what goes on on his island, and if I did, I might want to forget. You know what I mean? It is very much a disavowal thing that's going on. People don't want to deal with the inconvenient morality of what's going on, so they dismiss it so they can continue living their lives. This is a key part of American life. You can only be like a proper American consumer if you are willing to disavow the horrors of what goes into production of something. The way, you know, different commodities externalize the cost of their production so that it's invisible, right? That's the only way you can truly do it. Um, Of course, if you know better and you still do it, then you are guilty, right? So that's, that's why it is important that he is shipwrecked because he is not voluntarily participating in this interaction, in this transaction. He's not participating in the, this system that allows Moreau to exist. And the same thing goes with this captain character. Uh, The reason why he's a drunk asshole is because he's a blue collar type worker, but it's again, non confrontational to an American viewer. It's saying, I'm not like this blue collar guy who would do this immoral thing. Even though if you saw this movie at the time and you were working for, you know, an (laughs) immoral, that by the way, that That dummy shot was wonderful. That's not a dummy shot. No, that's not a dummy shot. The way he was flailing in some of those. That wasn't him, but that wasn't a dummy shot. Uh, but at any rate, the reason why he's a drunk asshole is so that audiences can distance themselves from, you know, identifying with somebody who participates in the system. It would be a little bit more scathing if this captain was a very upstanding captain who seemed like every expectation of a stand-up guy, you know? Yeah. Because then it, it implicates that stand-up guy type of character in the immorality of what's going on here. So in this, in that sense, I think you could definitely argue that this, this type of horror movie definitely falls into the pattern of what people, uh, horror critics have termed, um, the idea of the return of the repressed model of horror movies where some sort of representation of a marginalized element of society is repressed and disavowed by society. And then they return to get vengeance upon the thing that represses them. Yes. 
and Kit does not acknowledge them. And here we have our introduction to Charles Lawton, who is amazing. Goes without saying, of course. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. He's the highlight performance of the movie by far. Yes. And it begins almost immediately. I mean, look at how interesting this note here with the, like, glibness. Montgomery's a fair sort of sailor. He's so sardonic and glib and weird, you know? And uh, the other really interesting thing about this introduction scene for him is the first shot of him feels very much to me like a, a reveal shot, right? And I am, I think it really catches my attention the extent to which they light his features in such a way as to make them also look exaggerated. Yeah. Also, I pointed out yesterday that one of the more prominent Beastmen's name is Oren, probably because he was... Brought up from an orangutan. Certainly, and perhaps. There was another one, he said, uh, whose name is Gora. So, What would that be? Gorilla. Oh, okay. Because he was a big black ape. <laughs> so. Maybe that was the guy that was uh, played by that wrestler called the German Oak. They do a good, if they're just wrestlers, they do a fine job. Like, it might just be because, like, the makeup they have on makes it weird to walk around normally, but they do walk like they're not used to walking on all on like two legs yeah they do a good job well before we talk about that i just want to finish saying that i think it's interesting you could maybe look at the introduction of moreau and different scenes with him are sort of expressionistic where this movie definitely takes the opinion even though i think it's not entirely unproblematic in its treatment of the natives it definitely has the opinion that moreau is the true monster he is really the animal in this situation um and morally, the movie is 100% okay with condemning him because of what he does. Uh, and the movie tries to have sympathy with the natives. Um, of course, I think what you're hitting on with the makeup is yeah. an important thing to mention because I, I mentioned earlier that I don't think this movie is entirely unproblematic. And I think the real area that it, it fails to really like transcend its sort of basis in white colonizing ideology is that even though it establishes the monstrous otherness as something that's totally artificial and um, something that is created by Moreau, it's still, when you get the reveal that the natives are actually animals this whole time, it still links that animal nature to exaggerated non-white features. Yeah. And it validates that link. Well, you know, you can uh, you could make an argument, okay, that we're trying to see it as th- like through the lens of the white colonialists who truly do view people with non-white features as lesser races and beasts, and the cruel treatment that Dr. Moreau is providing them is the colonial efforts of like, oh, well, I'm just trying to elevate them to our status, but they're still always going to be below us. Which is still problematic, but that's kind of where the, I think at least the, like the movie would be coming from because otherwise why the hell would you do that? Or it could just be, yeah, examples of old schooly racism, but. Well, I think it's, I think it's trying to be critical of racism, but again, that link is still like you're saying the problem because it's not like, it's not like there's a, a character that has exaggerated like white features. Yeah. You know what I mean? Except white people are no less animals in this world than... But we just we did have you know, the line that you pointed out yesterday. It's like the fact that this actor and this uh, performance of Dr. Moreau is a British accent, and he's, he's from London, as we find out later. But, but is he? But he says that his skill with a whip is something he picked up in Australia. Right. Which... Is conspicuous. It's conspicuous. He doesn't have an Australian accent. He has a very British accent and he is very British in his mannerisms. And yet he is skilled with whip from Australia. I mean, this movie is definitely talking about colonialism. Yeah. So, you know, it is that mixed bag situation where, you know, we can watch this and we could say, this is definitely trying to tackle these issues in its subtext. I think that's very clear. Um, And it is, very critical of those things. And at times during this movie, even though it sometimes makes excuses for its audience and doesn't confront them at other times, it does confront them. Um, so it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Uh, but ultimately I think 
you know, the, the validated connection between the animal features and in like non-white features physically is something that uh, limits the effectiveness of this movie's critique. But yeah, like you're saying, lines like that are just, they're fantastic. And I would say like, I think a good way to describe most of Lawton's performances are like delicious or like devilish, you know? And the way he relishes this role really like brings life to a lot of that. And this is another interesting moment. Um, And it's the first moment in which we'll see that Lawton is able to subdue a sense of moral righteousness and indignation in our protagonist by appealing to a sense of manners. And he does this multiple times. And it's interesting because every time it happens, it becomes more and more clear to us that he's in danger, and yet he still does nothing. Yeah. And uh, I think the fact that we can tell he's in greater danger after every occurrence this happens is not merely us as viewers responding, but this moment, right? This is the very first moment we are now detached from the perspective of our protagonist. And now we know information that he does not know, right? So we know better than he does the situation he's in. And as the movie goes along, we get more and more scenes that he is not a part of. We get more and more access to the like mischievous, devilish, conniving plans that this Dr. Moreau has. And yet every time he still allows himself to be subdued by Moreau's appeal to his like, I guess you you would say class solidarity. His kind civility. Of, his, his shared whiteness. Yeah. Every time it works against him until the very end. Well, Moreau is like, he's very charming. Like that's, that's a, such a strength of the performance is like, you know, from like almost the very beginning that Moreau is just like an awful, horrible human being. Right. But you still want to see him on screen constantly. Just yes. Because he's charming and he, his presence takes up the entire scene. Thus is the power of Charles Lawton. Yes. But the funny thing about that is that he, he's like, he ha- is very charming, but he's simultaneously has a, Mephisto goatee. Yes. And looks so fucking evil. <laughs> and I don't know if Charles Lawton ever got an opportunity to play a Satan character, but he certainly played a lot of really like evil characters. And he's yes. always done amazing in that type of well, role. Well, you had brought up the idea of was it queer coding at the time? Ah, yes, that's another thing. Because he's very glib too. Yes. He's very, I brought up that his fashion sense reminds me a bit of a Southern dandy type. Um, Well, this is, this is the weird conversation we had with the queer coding and why it's a little bit hard for us to come down on it one way or another because Charles Lawton himself was very queer. Um, He was, it was sort of like an open secret that he was gay. Um, He was married to Elsa Lanchester, although I don't think he was at this time. Uh, who is also gay, but they were beards for one another. It is what it is. Um, So obviously I feel like a lot of the flamboyance he brings to this role and a number of other roles is something that he brings to it, and that's how he plays different types of roles. At the same time, um, queer coding is definitely something that happens, and when you have a movie that is so much about the idea of creation and stuff like that as this one, I think you could definitely make that argument. But what you were saying about his outfit and how it relates to like a Southern plantation owner, you know, yeah, especially when he's walking around with the whip, you know, that's definitely an image of the plantation people who wear all white in the hot summer sun. Uh, and that's their outfit to go in. But also there's like a certain idea of like what a Southern dandy, yeah. Type of person. So I don't know. It's kind of hard for me to. I do declare this weather's made me a bit, give me a bit of the vapors. Yeah, exactly. Right. So which one is it? I don't know. And maybe it could be all of them, you know? It could be, yeah, in one influencing the other, or vice versa. But we, I, I do appreciate bringing up queer coding whenever it's a thing because it is a prevalent, harmful trope. Um, right. And it went on, it still goes on to this day to a lesser degree, but. 
Although, you know, it's, it is surprising to see a movie from 1932 present it in such a way where you do feel ambi- ambiguity yes. about the extent to which it's happening. I think part of the ambiguity... Dr. Moreau doesn't, like, rub our protagonist's shoulders. It's not like a James Bond villain. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Bond, you were not just supposed to break those chains. Mm. I'm going to have to hit you now. I'm going to Ugh. poke you with my laser. Not like most. Like, there's so many Disney villains that are queer coded. It's ridiculous. But. Right. And, you know. Although I have seen amongst a lot of my uh, LGBT friends. Yeah. Uh, that queer coding kind of backfired <laughs> for a lot of them. Oh, you mean. Where their sexuality is just villains. Now. <laughs> oh, well, but, that's great. Um, and that like, would you say Ursula is queer coded? Yeah, to a degree. Um, but also but like she's done it in su- she's done in such a fun way. That, like she she's is- the best Disney character maybe ever. Yeah. Like I was just singing poor unfortunate souls the other night with some friends. Um, yeah. Like I like it's, you know what else it is? You cannot come close to char- the charisma of divine. No. So when you make divine Ursula, even though it's not divine at all, it's, now that you've gone there, what you think I care about your stupid, handsome dude in a suit? No, that's I remember you know, that was like, my problem with Little Mermaid when I was growing up is like there's this huge chunk of the movie that I don't care about because Ursula is just not in the movie. For I want to see her being a very busy woman. Yeah. Who has no time. And her well, I mean the character design too is yeah. amazing. But that's such a great character. You know they're gonna cast uh, Guy Fieri <laughs> Once in the uh no, I think I think I saw that on Twitter. He's uh, lobbying for the role. Yes, here we have the horrifying reveal, and he's going to say they're vivisecting a man to Loda here, and uh, they're really not. This is the only time vivisecting comes up. Apparently, vivisecting was part of the advertising campaign, and uh, apparently, it was a, a hot topic at the time. I don't know why. I guess. Medicine was still new in 1932. <laughs> well, up until now, medicine was just like, oh, you've got a paper cut and time to chop your arm off. Leeches. <laughs> Otherwise, the gangrene will set in. You know, I, you know, doctor, I've been having some you know, problems with performance. and th- Leeches. <laughs> just replace your dick with a leech. <laughs> well, listen, if we put a leech in your dick, it'll draw the blood to your dick and you'll get hard. That's how it works. <laughs> I'm so glad I wasn't alive. Thank God. You wouldn't have been for long. Yeah, I would have been dead by now. I would have, because I had a appendicitis. I was just talking about this with somebody where it's just like, maybe we should change the Supreme Court from being lifetime appointments, because when that was written, there was a pretty good chance you wouldn't live past 25. So At the very least, somebody could duel you if yeah. it was a problem and then kill you. Maybe Brett Kavanaugh will drink himself to death and get lucky. I'm going to challenge Brett Kavanaugh to a duel. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, just <laughs> that scene with Karen Allen and Raiders from the Lost Ark. Yeah. She's drinking against Brett Kavanaugh. <laughs> oh, my God. This Here's our oh, plan. Bella Lugosi. Bella Lugosi. The amazing scene. Even... With a beard taped to his face and head. He does. He does give a great performance. He does give a good performance. Um, Unfortunately, this was, you know, I feel so bad for Bela Lugosi in so many ways. Yeah. He was already, I think, bankrupt at this point, although I don't know if he had been addicted to heroin yet. Yeah. Um, But it's, it's really a shame the degree to which studios back in this time just were capable of fucking people over to such an insane degree, whether it's people like Bella Lugosi or people that their stars were really nasty to, and then they just covered it up somehow. You know, like a lot of people got fucked over by studios at this time. Yeah. And then you go out being in an Ed Wood movie. You know what? Actually, no, that no, I'd go out going in plan nine from outer space, maybe, but not like, Orgies of the dead or whatever. Yeah. He didn't even finish that, did he? Didn't he, like, die halfway through it or something? Oh, I don't even know if that's the name. Yeah. He made a number of orgy movies, Max. And so he could have the 
costumes left over so he can dress up afterwards. And that's an interesting thing, though. I wonder if Ed Wood was, like, suffering from gender dysphoria. Just Maybe. there's. It's hard to know Yeah. because of... You'd have to do, like, a language analysis of how people really talked about gender at that specific time and then compare it to if there were any documents about how he expressed yeah, well, stuff like that. Because that's know? the thing. Like, as... I, like I personally identify as non-binary, but it's a completely different experience than being trans. And there are some people that like, they're not trans. They're just like, for whatever reason, dressing up as a girl gets their dick hard. And it's kind of insulting. That's actually some of the problem that uh, trans folk I know now have a problem with Rocky Horror Picture Show, but because it's sort of a fetishization of it. Right. But, um, but anyway, we got from all this from Vivisection. Yes. Welcome to the Spectator Film Podcast. I think it's interesting. Yeah, it is. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention, though, In, apart from, th- by the way, this is the second wor- appeal to whiteness here, right? I'm not going to overpower you. Or b- it's quite evident that mm-hmm. I mean you no harm. Yes. Isn't it? Right? Yeah. This is nothing if not an appeal to whiteness. Moral outrage is immediately quelled and quieted. But uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was the degree to which Loda was part of the marketing campaign. Uh, This character is 100% an invention of the movie and has been in all three adaptations. And I think this is part of why uh, Wells hated the movie. (laughs) Um, This female character did not exist and... uh, it was originally a marketing thing where they said, like, you could be the Panther Woman in our movie. It was a competition nationwide. And uh, I think there were about 60,000 participants in total, mm-hmm. although I'm sure that that number has been hyped up yeah. a little bit. Uh, the rig- the winner was a woman from Chicago. She was 19 at the time. She was a model, actually, too. Sure. There you go. And uh, it was completely shoehorned in. However, part of the interesting thing of that is that it makes this movie kind of in the liter- like the tradition of Tempest stories, Shakespeare's The Tempest, which I find very interesting as a play because it has a lot of like generic versatility. It's a very weird play, and depending on the way you stage it, it can participate in any number of different genres. Um, there's a lot of like elements floating around, and somehow they work together in the overall play. But one of the things that it kind of helped invent is this tradition of mad scientist type of stories yeah, um, where you have somebody who is isolated on an island, perhaps, or some other form of isolation where they are working on some sort of magic or creation type of thing, right? And Miranda as a character is somebody who is very much associated with this island and is kind of like the creation coming from the island and the inspiration that the creator finds there. Um, Other comparisons for like generic adaptations for the Tempest, obvious ones are like Forbidden Planet is a very obvious one. People talk about that a lot. Um, Yeah, there have been a number of them, but almost every story where you have this mad scientist character is going to participate with that in some way. Yes. And all the more so when you have Miranda here. But the other part of it is the Caliban character, which is kind of the other most famous black character in Shakespeare's sort of writings, aside from Othello. Othello, Yes. And whereas Othello is a very noble character who is attacked for the color of his skin and it makes him vulnerable in the society in which he's living, Caliban is definitely a a character that was conceived of with colonialism in mind. He's totally a colonized subject. And uh, that goes all the way down to the ambiguities of language. Um, One of the things he talks about with Prospero, which, you know, he has a very antagonistic relationship with Prospero, uh, is that Caliban was taught language and how to speak by Prospero. And part of it relates to this idea of language being, again, something we've talked about in other episodes, Uh, something that is regulatory in its own right and changes the way you think and conceive of ideas in yourself. Um, So it can be limiting to you if it's biased against you, right? 
But and also, I think that is at play here as well. I also wanted to bring up, because you brought up how prominently Lotto was featured in the marketing. Lotta? Yes, sorry. Not Lotto. Lotta, I said. Lotta? Yeah. Whole lot of Lotta. Yes. Because um, <laughs> the, the original poster I could find from Paramount for this, it features her topless with her hair covering her cleavage and the... Wait, really? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, that's just the poster. But, um... And also the the subtitle of the Panther Woman Lord Men on only to destroy them body and soul. She doesn't do any of that in this movie. Yes, total lies. Yes. This is not a movie about a Panther Woman. I'm not even sure if they ever say that she's like of like what animal that they evolved her from. Oh, I guess movie. I assumed she was a Panther. Well, I don't know why. No, but I like guess I saw the poster. Yeah, the poster yeah. says it, but I'm like, I'm not sure in the movie if they ever say it. But yes. So, you know, the, the other interesting thing about bringing that Tempest connection into this is how this movie definitely dwells upon the artificiality and the arbitrary nature of the way that M- Moreau goes about these creations. We just got the line from him, right? Do you know what it feels like to be God? The same line that we get from Frankenstein after he succeeds in his invention although here it's a very different connotation he's lit from below it's a classic horror movie moment clearly the implication is not that he's god but that he's the devil yes right especially with the mephistopheles yeah facial hair he's got going on and uh i think when you look at those things you can really dig into the subtleties of how colonialism like works this movie demonstrates all that so how does it work so he takes these animals And then he projects everything about the colonial mindset onto them. And it begins with the arbitrary conclusion that of like evolutionary, like psychology and like biology is that the white human is the climax and end point of human evolution. Yeah. Beginning assumption, right? So already he doesn't know how it works, (laughs) but every animal is moving toward humanity. humanity. He says this line, human humanity is the current climax of life on earth. Right. So every, but what he really means is the white human is the current climax of life on earth. Right. So he conceives of evolution and biology in this linear evolutionary way. And then what he does is he says that everything that does not fit this template is not a climax being and therefore. Oh my God. Sorry. Not human. I I love this overacting thing (laughs) where he's like, Oh, I could, who knows what happened to it? What could have possibly happened to the boat? Yes. Everything he does is so wonderfully glib. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Montgomery, like, dude, you're overselling it a lot. (laughs) Montgomery does that a lot where he just does like, it's like a moment from the office. He's just like, he's just reacting. He might as well look at the camera. Yeah. But yes, so, you know, again, it's really worth dwelling the, on the way this movie visualizes the artificiality of how Moreau generates physical otherness by first arbitrarily, you know, deciding that the white guy is the climax of what humanity is. And then we're back to this, which I guess, like, plot-wise, this serves to find another way to get him off the island, but, like... I don't know. The fiance character doesn't really do anything. No. And she, she essentially becomes a victim later on. Yeah. Although part of the other interesting thing about this little interlude is the way in which it becomes yet another opportunity for the movie to distance what's going on from its audience. We're going to get this moment where she pleads with the captain and he's a huge fucking asshole, right? Yeah. And yet she goes to the American consul. And when she does, that guy reads him the riot, riot act. Yes. But what that does is it essentially paints this blue collar sailor character as somebody who is incompatible with American law. So this movie is saying America doesn't do this. America doesn't allow this. America doesn't allow you to behave in this social, in this morally questionable way and get away with it, which is obviously wrong. In fact, disavowing the immorality of the, you know, the transactions you're carrying out and the capitalist system in which you're moving is like, a fundamental part of American life. But again, this movie allows, allows its audience the, uh, the escape route here by saying that the American console does not allow this. 
No, sir. Yeah, no, sir. No, sir. No, yeah, no. Yeah. But we never find out what happens to him. Does he get his license revoked for providing animals to whatever the... I don't know. I want to know. All I know is that this character actor, whose na- name I don't know, this guy who just entered, I saw him in another movie last weekend called The Oxbow Incident, which is a great movie. I watched it for the first time. and When I started preparing for this episode, I was very confused. Don't worry. He's not around for long. Are you saying that he died? Well, he does die in this movie. Yeah, but in real life. I, I'm sure he's dead. Why did you kill him? You've got to stop doing that. I You've got to li- stop killing people. I didn't people. like his role in this movie. I said him and the fiance were... I had nothing to do with the fiance's death. She was already dead when I got there, but... What? She doesn't die in this. I'm talking about real life. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. That's a beautiful shot, by the way. Yes. One of the few moments, I think, where Carl Struess really gets to escape the more utilitarian camera work here and and add some flourish to it. Oh, she... She's, like, for somebody who just, like, got the role from a contest or something, she does do a good job. I'm not sure if this is directing of just, like, doing cat-type things almost, where, like... The head thing there was just like, if you have a cat, like that's how you scratch it right. behind the ears. Like clearly, it's a it's you know conceived of in the role, but I think she does fine. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, a lot of it has to do with just like sitting wide eyed, okay. and like her physical presence. I, but that's not I to do take wish away. She had from... more to do, especially since like at the end of the movie, spoilers, she like stalks one of the beast men in the the. Well, like she hides in the tree like a panther and passes right. down on him. She helps save them. Yes. Um, it would be interesting to get more moments of like introspection from her. I yeah. think the closest thing we get is a scene that's going to be coming up where we see her sort of at a vanity mirror. Yes. After this moment where they have, they finally kiss one another and her claws come back. She has a moment of distress at her vanity mirror right before, you know, Lawton barges in and then starts screaming at her. But the other thing we should mention, too, about what's interesting about the Loda character, and especially being a character that was conceived of in reference to a giant marketing push, was that she's very much like a t- uh, stock image of, like, a type of, like, Indonesian, like, yeah siren woman. Even though she was born, I think, like, Illinois or something like that. Right. I mean, I don't know where her family's from. or And I don't even know if that's, like, her real hair. Yeah. But I've told her I loved that shot. The yeah, the rippling the water. Yeah, that was yeah, so good. Like there's definitely a sunrise type of shot, right? Yeah. Well, like you said, this doesn't have as good camera work as sunrise, mainly because they had to shoot on location for a lot of it. Mm-hmm. Um, instead of building huge, elaborate, interesting sets, they built a number of sets, but they did. But you know, it's very utilitarian, and this is a much cheaper movie than Sunrise. But yeah, that's all just to point out that you know, definitely this this image of the woman wearing like the two piece outfit with the long flowing hair, like you said in the poster without even the top part of that outfit, but just covering her breasts. That's definitely like a type of stock image Ow, (laughs) that would hurt. But again, this is a very interesting moment too, because we've had the scenes where our lead character is able to embrace the appeals that, that Lawton makes to his whiteness, right? Except now that he has acted upon his, his like stigmatized attraction to Loda, he didn't know it was stigmatized attraction, but now he does. Yes. You know? Well, also like... Because she could pass, but now he knows the truth, and now he's going to act on it. But it was also morally wrong because he's engaged, and like right. that's why he pulled away at first, but then he gave in again until he's just like, wait a minute, you made me a fucking furry. Right. How dare you? Well, that's essentially what's going on, <laughs> because yeah. it's like... It's, it's made it so that he's crossed boundaries. And in in this moment, he's, he expresses it in good and bad ways, where he says, in a good way, like, he's expressing his outrage over what he's done to torture her, which essentially would be good. But then he said, oh, I could have overlooked the others. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I didn't want to fuck Bela Lugosi. But- right. But now I'm implicated in this because you forced me to acknowledge my desire for her. Oh, God. And also, in doing so, you have also forced me to acknowledge that she is human in a specific capacity. 
when I know that she's actually an animal now. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's also kind of like, you know, it, it, it's the reactionary position that forces him. He, it's only out of sheer discomfort that he responds. But then again, we get this really interesting moment here where we get the back and forth addresses to the camera, right? And I think in reference to the marketing campaign, this is maybe an interesting moment. They're both looking straight into the camera. And now Lawton is coming clean saying that she was an animal, but I tricked you, (laughs) relying on your attraction to her. Yes. You know, it is kind of maybe an interesting moment to look at in reference to that marketing campaign and maybe how the audience was going. So I think, you know, this movie, while it does find certain opportunities to excuse its audience for participating in this colonial type of world, it still kind of (laughs) manages to address them. That was a good uh, punch, though. Yeah, the punch itself was weak, but the reaction was good. That's what I meant. Yeah. It's he doesn't go flying against the wall like a rag doll. It looks like a real reaction. He staggers backward and knocks her shit over. Yeah. Well, it's also reminding us that Moreau isn't like a physical threat. It's right. His mental wit and charm and the horrors he's created, that's the real threat. The other interesting thing I wanted to mention is, you know, we've talked about how this movie makes the categories of human and um, non-human and white and non-white explicitly artificial by making them products of, uh, you know, Moreau's insane focus on creating a white person. And I think it's interesting because when he when he does all that, he invents the category of native and projects it onto them, like we've talked about. And we see that actually in retrospect even more literally um, because we know on this island that there are no natives to this island, right? So literally, even if they were still animals, they would not be natives. We know they're being shipped there. There are no natives to this island. So when we call them natives automatically... Uh, the way our protagonist does when he says you have weird natives here. That's also an interesting moment. Native is an artificial category that has been created here. But also when we acknowledge that native is an artificial category on the flip side of that, it's like Moreau does this to simultaneously invent his own whiteness. Yeah. So he's inventing physical difference for the natives here but also inventing whiteness for himself. It's like a double move he's doing. It's very interesting. I'll make her completely human. Like, what are you going to do? File her nails down? It's, you know, I think this line makes what goes on in the House of Pain very creepy to me because it's very nonspecific. Well, the yeah. way the technology works. He mentions just like, oh, like, yeah, this is sections, organ transplants it, but like, Rainbow Mardman, he like lists just like all a bunch of things. Like, but when he w- uses a verb to describe it, it's burn. Yeah, I'm gonna burn all the end. It's such a disturbing line. God. I mean, he gets his comeuppance at the end. In a very, he does. Yes, they burn the fuck out of him. That poetic justice. Yeah, he's Gola. Now, Max. Yes. If you lived on a private island. Okay. I have my private island. I'm, I have no question. I'm, I'm, I just had a premise. Yes, I'm in. Oh, come on. <laughs> if you lived on a private island. Okay, I'm envisioning my island. Go on. And there were dinosaurs there. How would you deal with that? I'd probably die. Okay. <laughs> I think that's what I'd do, too. Glad we got that out of the way. I'd play the Jurassic Park theme on my phone and then get beaten. <laughs> oh my god! Also, like, yeah, all those animals lived millions of years apart from each other. They probably wouldn't know how to react to each other either. So, dude, they'd probably just kill everything. It, By the way, we just had that interesting. Lo- oh, now we're getting it I remember, again about the parrot. Yeah, on rewatching this, I'm just like, oh, is this Captain? 
in on it too. I don't know, because I had forgotten the ending of this movie for the most right. part. Because like he seems to be almost making excuses. It's just like, oh, that was a weird noise. Did you know there's a parrot that makes that exact noise that I just made up? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, honestly, I the moment I saw him, I'm like, this guy is a body count. Yeah, guy, like he just seems too silly. By the way, here's a really obvi- obvious but interesting shot with the uh, Moreau sort of on the upside down cross. Those beams that are there for no reason. It's very interesting. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun. What? They could potentially fuck everything up. I guess they do kind of fuck everything up. Despite the fact that Moreau tries to incorporate them to his plans, but... Yeah, no. Well, because we don't know what would happen if Moreau had, like, finished the operation on Lada or whatever. Um, and if Parker had stayed stranded there forever. The real, the real thing of this movie, though, is that it implies the impossibility, too, of what Moreau is actually trying to do. Yes, where the law itself, like, in order to maintain his control, he needs to make an exception and have them break the law. But right. that shows them that they didn't need it in the first place. But that reveals the truth about the law yeah. and his goals, which is that no matter what he does, he's always operating from the like baseline, fundamental like assumption of what humanity is, which is 100% arbitrary. So everything else after this is arbitrary. The law is arbitrary. And that's what they learn about it when he tells them to break it for no reason. Well, it's not no reason. It's they want to kill the captain, so right? That they all can't get off the. But it the, like we're saying, the point is that it just reveals that, that it's it nothing. That is arbitrary. Yeah. Yes. And it and interestingly enough, it when they re- learn that the law is arbitrary, that's the same moment that they learn that his like beyond reproach godlike white identity is arbitrary you know yeah where they're like oh we killed somebody so the law is violated but inevitably now that means that the white authority on which that law is based is also arbitrary and means nothing so now we can just go after him you know it's very interesting and it that is one of my favorite sequences and we'll be getting to it soon where he's just like trying to regain all vestiges like with the whip and it just shows them like it bouncing harmlessly off of them him reminding them of the house of pain but that doesn't end up well for him at all like uh. and then we're gonna what is she gonna do she, her, for being a panther woman her makeup is on point yeah I do think they, they do a good job with her image here I mean obviously if it's such an important part of the marketing campaign you're gonna want to you know, make sure you, I don't know, are aware of that when you're doing it. Now, Max, here's an interesting moment we talked about too with the Montgomery character. We were trying to figure out, does the movie at all indicate what Montgomery might have been charged with in England that forced him to flee? I think we had both had the same first thought, actually, um, which was him carrying out an abortion. Yes. Um, And part of the reason... Well, there are two reasons. One, he seems to have more sympathy with Loda. Right. And and also he starts to break with Dr. Montgomery when he sees the fiance and says, yeah, Moreau, sorry. Yeah. Slip of the tongue. But yeah, he starts to break with Dr. Moreau when he suggests that like, oh, we don't need Parker. We can let the beast men rape this woman and see if they can reproduce that way. Right. And it's very much like, the specific thing where definitely he he is responding to the sanctity of the white woman <laughs> in a specific way, right? But also like he seems to he seems to react to women in in this very specific women in this very specific capacity. Yeah, um, that makes him break with Doctor Moreau. So I think it's it's possibly implied that that might be the closest answer you get. Um, but that also is a good opportunity to talk about another interesting thing that this movie reveals about what happens when you establish like a strong emphasis on 
genes and, uh, you know, eugenics as a definition of humanity is that the next logical conclusion of that is that women are reduced to a biological function of breeding. Yeah. Because when, when the definition of human is fundamentally rests upon genetic composition, then, then women are just repositories for genes, right? They're just ovens that can like gestate the new human in. Sorry, I was just looking up abortion laws in London at the time of this film being made, and it was still illegal. Yeah. Um, okay, that makes sense. I mean, they don't really specify when this movie takes place, but I reckon it's probably... Well, if it's before... Yeah, at if, this point. Before the late 60s, then it's going <laughs> to be right. illegal in England. So. <laughs> what are you talking about? That's very much like uh, that moment from Bicycle Thieves, where they're like, I'm so hungry. <laughs> you know what else is interesting to look at is how alcohol is something throughout this movie that shows up. I didn't even think about this, but there's numerous scenes where they discuss like alcohol explicitly. Yeah. First with the captain, but then also you have the weird moment on Parker's first night on the island where they're drinking. And then he talks about how Montgomery is very good at selecting booze. And then you have this moment where they're like talking about the booze again. I don't know. That's kind of interesting. And then you're also going to get this line where the, you know, this, I don't even know what this guy's name, this poor fucking man (laughs) who's about to get murdered uh, talks about like, it's a good thing I ain't a drinking man for some reason. Is the implication that he would get thirsty and drink? No, I think it's just that he saw all the taxidermied animals and he would be like freaked out by them or something. Because but... they, it first focuses in on like the stuffed boar or whatever that was. That was a baboon. Baboon. Okay. Max, you don't recognize a baboon when you see one. You've yeah. got. You should. I mean, baboons are dangerous. Got to watch out for them. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> Okay. I don't know. I just saw darkish hair. I wasn't paying attention to that particular thing. Max, if it was a boar, it wouldn't be one boar. It would be 30 to 50 feral hogs. Get that fucking meme (laughs) trash out of our (laughs) podcast. Get it out of here. (laughs) (sighs) Makes me upset. Oh, man. Just happy you caught a meme while it was still relevant and you're not referencing something from 2012. Oh, it's not even relevant anymore. Okay, but seriously, though, if you have 30 to 50 wild hogs in your backyard, like... You've got bigger problems. Those things are fucking huge. I think the point of it was that it was a lie. That that suggestion. <laughs> that that never happens. You have to have 30 to 50 wild hogs in your backyard. You have to kill them in five minutes. In three to five minutes, if you have three to five children, I believe. Yeah, I've been scarified of, yeah, scarified. <laughs> New word. Yes. Yeah, so Hashtag I'll, scarified. Of wild hogs ever since I watched uh, Princess Mononoke when I was a young kid. Is there a wild boar? There's a whole tribe of wild boars. <gasps> 30 um, to 50 of them? Yes, probably. Oh my God. We'll have to do Princess Mononoke now. But, yeah. It's Hayao Miyazaki, a Russian troll. <laughs> <laughs> it's been playing the long con. Completely redefine a medium of animation <laughs> in order to trick those Americans. I'm going to brainwash them by putting subliminal messages in my children's animated movies with adult themes that are intelligent. And then what I'm also going to do is then tweet about it years later so that it makes sense to them. Yeah. I mean, in support of the NRA, the, the most famous quote from Miyazaki on the internet at this point is him smoking a cigarette, shaking his head, saying anime was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Did I ever show you that uh, that amazing clip of him reacting to that? Like, I don't even know what it is. It's like an animation test, but it's like it's like um, it's almost like they built some sort of like animation, like procedural thing to make things move really creepy and disturbing. 
And his response is just like, for anybody to make this and think it's beautiful, you must not have any human emotions at all. Uh, and he says this to them in yeah, like a boardroom full of people. He's not very, he doesn't sugarcoat anything. <laughs> it was pretty amazing. He's like, this is one of the most repulsive things I've ever seen. And I certainly won't be investing in your company. <laughs> it was pretty awesome. He's also like said he's going to be retiring like five times and every time. I mean, he hasn't made a movie in what? Almost 10 years now. Yeah, but six yeah. years. Okay, yeah. not almost ten. Six years. I forget if he did Ghibli's last movie or not, if he was involved with that. No, the last one he did was The Other Side of the Wind, right? It could be. Or no, I'm sorry. That was the last Orson Welles movie. Uh, the Wind Rises <laughs> was the last one he did. Both both connoiss- yeah, both auteurs and people who helped redefine mediums, so it's understandable. Yeah, you know. We've been thinking about doing a Hayao Miyazaki movie for a while. Yeah. Except we don't. We also don't want to support Disney when they're launching their new bullshit streaming service. So I don't know. Um. Oh, okay. So yeah, the last. Uh, I guess you're right. The last one that he directed was um, from Up on Poppy Hill in 2011. So no. Not not. Oh wait, no. Um. Well, he's doing a new one. Oh, so he is doing a new one. Yeah, it's coming out called uh, How Do You Live? But the one he directed was up on Poppy Hill. So, no, the last one he did was The Wind Rises, 2013. Oh, yeah, look at that. Yeah. It was completely on the wrong thing. But at any rate, back to the island of Lost Souls. The other thing I wanted to mention, too, is I was sort of playing devil's advocate with myself about this connection that the movie makes to the exaggerated non-white features. I actually found a decent article that I believe is called, um, are we not men? I can't forget the author, but I'm going to link to it in the notes. And they articulated what I was feeling about that in a very intelligent way, where ultimately what this movie does is it, it links the definition of humanity to what they said was the genetically determinist position. Right. And, um, I think that is a good way of expressing it, right? They're saying it's genetically determinist, which means it's very dependent upon the body, which means it validates the idea that bodily difference can reduce your capacity for humanity or being deemed human. Um, And I think this movie definitely hits that part of it a little bit more because it's not like, again, you could construe any of these natives as occupying like a white position, I don't think. But the other thing I was thinking with that is that, okay, if Dr. Moreau, if we know that this movie is very much about the artificiality of these features, that these exaggerated features, could you also not argue that it is saying that part of, part of the difference that we're, we're like recognizing in the way that these natives are depicted is once again construed by Moreau? Yeah. Well, we get the scene of society breaking down instantaneously. Yeah. Like, I guess my other question is like, okay, if, if Moreau is the one who is definitively responsible for these features, is he not also kind of projecting physically yeah. these things onto them? So I don't know. I think it's a complicated question. And I think that's what happens when you have an intelligent movie that is really examining the nature and with in like, in which difference is engineered. It's not something that happens normally. And I think it's very important that we get this moment again, and that we once again are able to leave the perspective of our lead characters. Um, Because even though I think you run into some not so great moments and cliches in this second part of the movie, uh, especially with like Oran, as we're saying, yeah. being the non-white, you know, brute who is, cl- it's typical image of this where they're climbing through the window to assault the innocent white woman. Um, but I think, you know, that sort of this moment where we get to see them without everyone else is very important from keeping them from being like a complete mob, you know, and kind yes. of like a faceless mob. Yeah, especially since 
<laughs> besides Oron and Lagosi. Yeah, like we we don't really have a lot of people. But I think it's important to see their like the change in the understanding, you know, that they have a certain level of interiority, right? And that they the, the movie does acknowledge them as characters in this moment. They're not just it's not just pure exploitation, you know? Uh, they are being treated as their own subjects in that moment. And I think that that is important to keep them from being, again, just monsters, you know? The movie does try to have a certain amount of sympathy with them. And at this point, like, I know Moreau feels superior to them and, like, he has them completely under his thumb, but, like, this seems stupid. Yeah. Well, he he is blind to why it's failed because he genuinely believes in the arbitrary rules he's established. And once again, as we've just seen, when they realize the law, it can be violated and that yeah. he can be that the white person can be killed, he immediately violates the sanctity of his like overlord identity. Oop. Now, here we're going to get the moment that's very much, again, going back to this idea of like revenge of the repressed, right? Where this, the disavowed members of society, in a, in a very almost political nature, yeah, I mean, for this moment. They're burning torches. And yeah. Rioting. Yeah. They're going to bring him to the house of pain. And the, you know, very appropriate metaphor for the danger of yeah, like. But this, the whip of the oppressor has no effect on them anymore. Yeah. Right? Yes. Very clear imagery. Montgomery, like, even he's just like, listen, I'm escaping because he's an asshole and we need to get out of here and he's gone too far, but I don't want him to get torn to shreds by Beastman, so we'll leave yeah. it open if he needs to. Again, the House of Pain is a great yeah. image of, like, just the edifice of the society that he's erected and how it creates them as, like, fractured subjects which is also an interesting part of this movie is that again this movie is a very quick runtime so it doesn't quite have the ability to dwell on a lot of this yes but it does establish the way in which you know these these colonial subjects are not they're like exiled subjects you know they are neither animal nor human right and they don't really have a homeland or like they're severed from their community and past by this presence of colonialism in their life. Right. And I think that's a very, you know, that's a big thing in, in all sorts of like colonial literature and everything is how like the colonial mindset creates exiles of people who become victimized by it. Yes. I mean, it becomes internalized within them. Yes. Um, like you, even you have Maling to the very end who is willing to die for him because yeah. he's, he's the closest up in the hierarchy because he yes. gets to serve Moreau directly. So it creates that psychologically complex yeah. moment, even if it doesn't really elaborate, elaborate on it too much, you know? And here we get the one moment with Law being a badass and one, I don't understand why she dies there, but, or here. Um, I wish we kind of had a little bit more of this. Oh, you mean with her doing Pan things? Just Panther things. All this stuff is so beautiful, by it the is. way. Oh, that's, that's I, it's such shot. an interesting thing when you look at like these older studio movies that have things that are like obviously sets, right? But they manage to look make it look so rich and interesting. Like there was another movie we were watching. I just realized he's climbing the asparagus that he put out earlier. <laughs> Save me, asparagus. He still thinks the house is gonna mm -hmm. save him. Oh, God. Now he's crowd surfing. Yes. This is what it's like at a Kid Rock concert. 
Hey, I thought you said you weren't going to bring up topical things, Max. How was that topical? Oh, he insulted the shit out of, uh, uh, oh God, what's her face? Taylor Swift. Okay. Saying really hateful things to her. I mean, I'd vote for Taylor Swift for Senate before I vote for Kid Rock for Senate. So, so. would I. And I would be horrified to do that. But. Yeah. Not a big Taylor Swift fan, but her music doesn't actively make me want to kill myself. So, And as far as I know, she's not, well, well it you know what? Her, I'm not going to make any assumptions. It took her several years to disavow like the weird 4chan thing, praising her as an Aryan goddess and savior of the white nation. But before she had to come out and just be like, I vote liberal, please leave me alone. Yeah. To be fair, that's a weird situation to be in, yeah. but I mean... You're making money. Say off. no to Nazis. <laughs> You're making no money off of these weird <laughs> fucking internet nerds who are calling you an Aryan goddess. So you don't want to disavow them until it gets too big. Yeah. God forbid you do that. That's showbiz, baby. Ah, oh, Bill Lugosi's fucking. He's very happy. He's happy, but it's like a shit eating, like mischievous. He does it great. He's, he does great facial acting, even with the amount of hair just it taped is a really to his neat face. performance yeah. yeah i wish he had more time to shine but by the way that's something else we didn't really mention that we discussed about this movie is how the makeup and stuff like that the production values are excellent yes but how that might also be something that you can construe as like maybe again reinforcing the potential problematic nature of linking the animal features to non-white features, right? Because of the fact that the movie doesn't overdo it, it becomes more recognizably non-white compared yeah. to just being crazy, you know? Like, you, it, I mean, essentially, it would still be the same because the exaggerated features would still definitely be coded as non-white. Yeah. You know, but... And the movie's over. Yeah, it's 70 minutes long. It, it this comes is and like, it goes. because. We've settled for a lot of movies that like, oh, I like this, but it drags a little. Yeah. This is a movie I would love to see more scenes of. Like, yeah, it definitely, I appreciate the quick runtime. And I wish movies were more willing to do that, you know, where they have faith in their actors and a premise. Yeah. And they just let it run out and they don't try to pad it, you know? I think that's a really good way to go about these movies. And that's why a lot of these older studio movies can be really fun because sometimes they're only 80 minutes long. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice. But I would um, still recommend this movie today i think it i would recommend it too yeah again i think we can both agree that it's not without some problematic points but i think it's a it's a smart examination of this in a pre-code way you know that's yes. an important part of this the fact that they had vivisection stuff on screen um i think it takes some chances in an interesting way and uh even though it's obviously not perfect i think it's it's important to acknowledge the way in which this movie is more sophisticated than potentially other, you know, Hollywood studio movies at the time that might be addressing similar things and how it marries that sophistication with something that is simultaneously like, you know, a borderline like exploitation, like schlock yeah. sensibility it in a certain be. capacity. Yeah. So I think that's a very interesting thing. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention but didn't is, uh, again, this movie plays with the excellent image in terms of colonial images of, uh, you know, the map. Yes. What is a greater cl image of colonialism than the map? This thing created by white Europeans that is like, it, it, it's like a colonial hyper-reality, right? You're, you're creating borders and lines where none existed prior, arbitrary borders and lines, and you're just doing it on top of what, you know, non-white people already named and discovered on their own. It's a great image for that. And uh, when when people talk about how Moreau's Island is, um, you know, not on the map at the beginning, I think it's a great way of saying that it is definitely, again, playing into the return of the repressed and combining that with colonialism. Uh, that island is not on the map because it's the repressed, unacknowledged, evil nature of colonialism that people don't want to look at, yes. you know? And uh, I think, you know, that really helps establish that image and it's done very effectively. Um, other interesting things you could look at with this movie, I think you could definitely approach it by looking at how you could compare this to like a twisted garden of Eden in, in some respects. Um, you could look at that in reference to like, 
you know, this isolated location being kind of like a primordial location that exists out of time would be I an interesting have, approach. I would have liked to go in more to the queer coding. I would probably have yeah. to yeah, investigate a lot more like Charles Lawton's personal life. You yeah. seem to know much more about than I do, but like it's an interesting subject. There's so much, there's so many lenses you can view this movie. And, and that's the great thing about these types of older genre movies is that you have people that are just really good, you know, crafts people working on a lot of these movies and they just crank them out. Right. And even at 70 minutes, uh, they're very good at, you know, subtly exploring and establishing a lot of interesting ideas, even if it's never really intentional in a lot of these different movies. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm really glad we did this movie. So am I. I would definitely recommend it to anybody, especially who has an appreciation for horror movies from this time and might not have seen this one, or uh, just anybody who's looking for like a good pre-code movie with some uh, solid performances very solid performances that's really what elevates this movie for me yeah so this has been the spectator film podcast you can find us at spectatorfilmpodcast.com or our episodes on itunes spotify or stitcher and uh yeah we'll be back next week assuming we don't die yeah do you have anything to add on to that or are we just crossing our fingers laws no more law no more okay goodbye everybody get out of here